Hello, and welcome to the short and second lecture of movement and disorders and the touch system. Uh, recently, we just went over the touch system itself and uh, the pathways involved, some of the receptors um, that transduce the signal from pain, temperature, and touch into something that the brain can understand. And we ended with this slide, um, which I sort of wanted to give a precursor to and then go back over it. So in these last 12 slides or so, um, we're gonna talk about movement disorders um, that affect um, people as a whole, including Parkinson's disease that we're gonna talk about and the specific brain areas that are involved. So again, we went over the areas of reception, meaning from the body to the brain in the touch, pain and temperature pathway, which just to review uh, and refresh your memory is from wherever in the body that they hit. I use the example of spraining an ankle. So when your ankle is sprained, we talked about the endorphins that reduce the pain. We talked about um, the swelling from the um, chemical soup or you know, specifically prostaglandins that um, try to protect that tissue damage um, and to sort of reduce that, uh, we take anti-inflammatories called NSAIDs. Um, those NSAIDs could be things like Advil, Motrin, Aleve, right? Things like that to stop the inflammatory pain. If the pain is sharp and very direct, it is the A1, I'm sorry, A delta fibers. And if the, if the pain is kind of dull and achy, but not in one specific necessary area, uh, that it is a C fiber. C fiber. Um, so from the area of injury up through the spinal cord, it crosses over. So if it's the left ankle, majority of the information goes to the right side of the spinal cord and up to the right hemisphere of the brain through the thalamus. Remember everything but the sense of smell. And then to the primary somatosensory cortex. From there to the somatosense, secondary somatosensory cortex and posterior parietal lobe, um, where it can hook up with the uh, dorsal stream of the visual and auditory systems we just previously talked about, and then over to the prefrontal cortex. So we know that the prefrontal cortex is taking everything and putting it together from all five senses and allowing us to make decisions on what to do with our body. In this case, if it is a sprained ankle, looking at movement, the prefrontal cortex selects the appropriate behavior and its target using a combination of bodily and external information. So here, just thinking about the touch system, um, we've sprained our ankle. We know that it hurts. It sent pain up there. It's caused prostaglandins to cause swelling of the ankle. So based on this information uh, and you know all other signs, the prefrontal cortex takes this information together and says, we need to either limp and put less pressure on it or hop on one foot if we can and put no pressure on it. When we are going to do a movement, um, and I used the example in the last lecture of shooting a free throw because it is a coordinated flow through movement. You've just been fouled. You go to the free throw line to shoot a free throw. Before you even shoot it, you're trying to get your bearings about you. You are catching your breath, maybe. If you were running down the court, um, you are trying to keep everything balanced. So the information that you need for programming this movement, this free throw that you've potentially practiced many, many times, many, many days. Um, so the target being reaching for in its location, if you're grabbing for something, in this case, you're grabbing the ball with both hands. You're going to shoot it up in the air at a certain angle or arc. Um, with a certain amount of force and hope that it falls through the hoop. Um, the supplement, so that's the premotor cortex is sort of planning that movement before it's done. Sometimes you see players in the NBA that actually pantomime making a free throw um, or shooting the free throw. The, uh, I don't know if you guys were paying attention to basketball during the Steve Nash era. Let's forget about his Laker career because that ended after like, abruptly. 
but uh, in his career, he was one of the best free throw shooters in the league ever. And one of the things that he always did um, was right before he shot the free throws, he would pantomime and, and shoot a fake one to sort of get his bearings down. That's sort of what the premotor cortex is doing for you. Supplementary area is uh, assembling the sequences of movements and coordinating both your left and right hands together. So I'm left-handed. I will shoot the ball with my left hand and use my right hand as sort of a guide to keep it going straight. So it coordinates movements between the two sides of the body. So task sharing between the hands, my left hand is pushing the ball towards the hoop. My right hand is helping to push it and guide it to go straight. Um, so our primary motor cortex is going to be executing the movement, right? Located next to the somatosensory cortex, the regular primary motor cortex at the very back of the frontal lobe. And um, it adds force and directional control. And then we have to coordinate our movements specifically. So we have the basal ganglia and cerebellum helping out. The cerebellum, of course, is maintaining balance refining the movement so that it's just a simple touch of my fingers. I don't have to um, use a great amount of force. It's almost a, uh, I guess you would call it a um, finesse skill more than a brute strength one. Um, and it controls our eye movements um, and learning the motor skill. So muscle memory is, is executed through the cerebellum. The basal ganglia is a secondary motor center in the brain and it uses information from these secondary areas and from the somatosensory cortex to integrate these movements, smooth movements. Um, so they're not jerky or rough. It's involved as well in learning the movement sequences. So you're using the basal ganglia and cerebellum to run the routine of shooting the free throw. And that's how that works. So looking at the main areas of the brain, here they are. Um, when information comes in, it comes in uh, from the touch system to that blue area, the, the uh, sort of lighter blue back in the front of the uh, parietal lobe, that is the primary somatosensory cortex, supplying the motor areas with information about the body. Um, you can see it's twin and purple right in front of it, which is the primary motor cortex. The, uh, in between them is the central sulcus, which separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. But these two gyri, these two hunks of brain are essentially twins. So what we feel from the environment touching us is in blue and what we do back in those same areas is in purple. And you can see that there is a, uh, it allows for a very almost seamless relationship between the two. So if there's somebody that's touching you or if you have an itch somewhere, you can scratch it really quickly in the same area because information is going right across in the same place. Um, we see the uh, posterior parietal cortex behind the primary somatosensory, which is supplying information about location of body parts in reaction to objects in space. Cerebellum down below, which has a relationship with the motor cortex to uh, coordinate movements. We see the supplementary and uh, pre-motor cortex um, right in front of the uh, primary motor cortex. So the premotor, a little bit lower in light, uh, almost a baby blue um, or aqua blue, is uh, combining information to, um, that's needed for programming. The supplementary motor area in orange is actually providing information and helping to um, combine both sides of the body, both arms or both legs or, or all of the above. And of course, our prefrontal cortex in green is allowing us to coordinate everything, integrate all five senses, make decisions, and carry out the information. Um, so it holds in memory information about the world and the body, selecting appropriate movements, target. Am I a little farther back? Am I a little closer? Do I need to shoot harder or softer? Put a little more arc on it, right? All of those things. Um, that takes into account not just muscle memory, even though you could probably do it with your eyes closed or blindfolded, you probably don't want to. You want, you're gonna to want to see the basket, visualize it. Visual information is very important um, and things like that. What's not pictured here obviously is sort of subcortical under the cortex near the thalamus and that's the basal ganglia. So um, looking at the primary motor area, 
it is again a twin of the um, somatosensory cortex and uh, when this was being discovered this cortex um, was being discovered by um, two neuroscientists um, who basically stuck electrodes in every little part of the motor cortex in order to figure out which muscles it stimulated. And what they found was that it makes a little map of the entire body and where you stimulate goes to a specific muscle or area. It stimulates, remember we talked about it as a dermatome. So thoracic one, thoracic two, sacral one, sacral two, cervical one, cervical two, et cetera, et cetera. So we know that there are 46 dermatomes or sections of the body that muscles innervate from the primary motor cortex. And what they noticed was that it makes, right, pretty much up a full person. So um, the artist rendering here looks like a little man who is controlled by the motor cortex and you can feel those same areas that go to the somatosensory cortex right next door. So the little man um, was um, called a homunculus and the word homunculus is Latin for little man. Uh, again, we go back to this idea that a lot of things were named for what they looked like. So because you could basically control the entire movement of muscles in a human being based on where you stimulate in the motor cortex, that this hunk of cortex and of course the, its twin, the somatosensory cortex, make up these homunculus or homunculi, right? So the homunculus is little man. So this is an artist rendering of what the little man would look like based on where the muscles innervate and where the commands are sent from the primary motor cortex. Um, here it says the basal ganglia. And again, uh, the picture is missing. So um, let me read the, the print first, and then I will take you again to the spot in your course where the information is already there. But the basal ganglia receives information from primary and secondary motor areas. It receives information from the somatosensory cortex, as we just uh, talked about in the last slide or two slides ago. Um, and it smooths out the movements using the thalamus as well to help it out. And it helps to learn movement sequence that are performed as a unit. So when you learn a dance move, when you learn to cook a certain way using certain ingredients and doing certain steps, when you get better at shooting free throws, um, the basal ganglia and the cerebellum are learning the movements and refining them and making sure that we can do them on a consistent basis, hopefully. Uh, if you're Shaquille O'Neal, your free throw percentage wasn't that great. If you're Steve Nash, it was amazing. Over 90% in his career of his free throws made. So going back to the movement page, um, here we already saw this and this and this. So here is um, sort of, let me zoom in. It's the one nice thing about having a touch screen. Um, the basal ganglia again is receiving information so you can see if I were to even zoom in a little more, there are three nuclei or three parts to the basal ganglia. We have the um, globus pallidus, which is that little yellowish off-white color with the two stripes, um, which is called uh, globus pallidus is Latin for pale globe because it looks circular like a globe and it is a pale yellowish white color. Um, Right next to it, uh, you can see that the basal ganglia structures are right next to and kind of surrounding the thalamus on the inner side of the brain, subcortical, right below the cortex. And we see two other ones. There's one that has what, uh, it's kind of rounded, kind of looks like a tail. The bigger part, which is called the caudate nucleus. Um, now that I see there's an error in this um, slide, it looks like it says claudate. It is not caudate, it's caudate with uh, just C-A-U. And caudate um, kind of means tail. So you can see it's this big structure in green that kind of goes around. And at the very bottom, you can see that there's kind of like a little tail to it. Um, underneath the thal thalamus, you see this thing called the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra, um, which is part of the basal ganglia, but we think of the basal ganglia as sort of these three structures. So we have the caudate nucleus, and we have the putamen, which is kind of on the left side, 
connecting the caudate to the globus pallidus. It's that thing in uh, sort of a purplish color called the putamen. Now, um, the caudate and putamen together are known as the striatum or the striate cortex because they make sort of a striped pattern. And that is sort of the main movement center. It's two thirds of the basal ganglia. So if you ever hear the word striatum or you hear striate cortex, it just refers to two thirds of the basal ganglia and the other third would be the globus pallidus. Now these areas here, the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra are also technically part of the basal ganglia. And those are actually the, uh, the substantia nigra specifically is one that we're gonna be focusing on um, for uh, when we talk about Parkinson's disease, which I'm about to do. So in this one, the substantia nigra, uh, nigra of course is Latin for the color black. Substantia means substance. So it's black stuff or black substance. What the substantia nigra gets is um, those, remember those dopamine neurons that we talked about are in the midbrain and the VTA or ventral tegmental area. And they are the ones that are responsible for dopamine. So dopamine has two different pathways. We already talked about dopamine in the reward pathway in chapter five, where it goes from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens, right? Um, which is near the hypothalamus and then from there to the frontal cortex, right? Uh, mostly the frontal cortex. Well, the secondary pathway is a movement center. Remember, we also talked about in chapter two, when we went over the neurotransmitters, that dopamine is also involved in movement. And we talked about, um, we're gonna talk about an overproduction of dopamine that causes uh, some of the symptoms of schizophrenia in the last chapter. And now we're talking about, um, uh, dopamine going to the basal ganglia. So specifically from the VTA to the substantia nigra, which you can see is connected to the caudate, putamen, globitus pallidus, um, sort of as a unit. So I'm not gonna get into the inputs and outputs of the basal ganglia, that's really complicated. But as you can see, um, the substantia nigra is, is a, a fairly big area. And uh, so we're going to concentrate on that as we go forward. So if I go back to the slides, if you'll allow me. The, ga the basal ganglia is involved in coordinating movements and smoothing out movements. And what that means is damage of the basal ganglia or inputs, right, like dopamine could really cause problems. Um, so here we see a brain with Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease is also known as that disease that Michael J. Fox has, if you guys are familiar with Michael J. Fox and um, his iconic Back to the Future movies, among others, but we'll go with Back to the Future because those are the most popular. Um, if you were to interrupt or damage that part of the brain, the basal ganglia, then movements would not be so smooth. Remember, they smooth them out. So one of the things we see in people with Parkinson's disease are motor tremors. Um, they're very rigid, which means they can't really walk so well. Um, motor tremors at rest, your, your hands are shaking. It's like little tremors. It's very jerky movements. Um, when, when people walk, it's really hard to start movement and it's really hard to stop movement. Once they get in motion, they don't walk smoothly. They look like they're, um, they drag their feet and don't necessarily pick up their feet when they walk, almost like they're trogging through a swamp. Right? Think about if there's really muddy, swampy water and you're trying to walk through it, you're going to walk really slow and almost a zombie or Frankenstein-like. Um, a lot of times people with Parkinson's disease have a loss of balance and coordination. And again, difficulty in moving. So it's really hard to initiate or start moving. And a lot of times once you start moving, it's also hard to stop. So um, one other... Uh, so, well, basically that's, that's the main symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And what is causing this? As you can see, these sort of Lewy bodies, which means that you see um, sort of dead cells and um, plaques in it that are destroying certain parts of the brain. In this case, you're getting deteriorate, deterioration of the substantia nigra, 
And again, that substantia nigra is not connecting to the globus pallidus, but it is connecting to what we call the striatum, which is made up of the caudate and the putamen. And um, that substantia nigra, what gives it that black substancy color is that that's the dopamine um, neurons and the dopamine that's going to the basal ganglia. So what's happening is that those dopamine neurons are getting damaged and they're, and they're getting destroyed, they're dying. So you're basically losing the input of dopamine into that secondary motor center. And what it's doing, that lack of dopamine in the basal ganglia is causing these problems, these tremors, rigidity. Uh, sometimes we call it a masked face where a person can't really show facial expressions because the muscles don't like to move or aren't able to move so well in the face. So it's hard to tell what their um, emotions are it's really hard for them to move. Um, and so it's a loss of dopamine in the brain. About 75% of those neurons are destroyed um, going to, to the uh, substantia nigra. And so that's what causes these problems. So of course, naturally, um, there is no cure for this, right? Um, but stem cells, as we talked about in chapter three, are a really good treatment plan because what do stem cells do? They're pluripotent. They can become new cells. If you lose um, or if dopamine neurons are destroyed, if we simply put new ones in there that can regrow, right, and become full healthy neurons, this may be a way to a cure for Parkinson's. Um, in... Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, um, the other treatment is that dopamine itself does not cross that blood-brain barrier that we talked about, right? That layer of epithelial cells that protects the brain, just like serotonin doesn't cross the brain by itself, but precursors of them do. So treatment, um, uh, treatment for this includes um, the precursor to dopamine that converts to dopamine inside your brain, which is called L-dopa or levodopa. So the letter L dash DOPA, which is a, um, one step below dopamine. Uh, people that take L-DOPA allows it to convert to dopamine in their brain and increase dopamine levels temporarily. It's not a cure because it's not fixing the problem. It's only giving more dopamine to allow for better movement. So it's kind of like, I like to think of it as having a hole in a boat. And when you do that, um, what the L-DOPA is doing is just sort of, you know, taking the water out of the hole, but you're not actually fixing the hole. So the hole's still there, right? We can't repair the hole except maybe with stem cells. Um, so giving you more dopamine is, um, or L-DOPA that converts to dopamine is definitely um, sort of the way to go uh, in treatment wise. But the treatment window um, remember that we have tolerance levels that you'll need more and more. Um, and there is uh, individual differences, which is a problem because um, some people can tolerate more dopamine, some people can't. And when we get into this idea of, um, when we get into schizophrenia, schizophrenia is actually caused by too much dopamine in the basal ganglia or in the striatum. So when people are being treated for um, Parkinson's with L-DOPA, if you give them too much and their body can't handle that much, it's going to give you the opposite effect. So one of the side effects from the drug is um, hallucinations and delusions as seen in the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Just like, as we'll talk about in chapter 14, giving dopamine antagonists to people who have too much dopamine is going to sometimes cause um, side effects that look like Parkinson's disease because you are trying to get the right balance of dopamine into the basal ganglia. Too little, Parkinson's disease. Too much, those positive symptoms of schizophrenia. So it's a very, very um, specific um, and very, very technical sort of uh, treatment, right? Because you don't want to have too much or too little and um, it's not always easy to balance it out. So looking at um, disorders of movement like Parkinson's disease, we see that, uh, of course, as we see the trend in all the chapters that we've gone over so far, about 
10% or less than 10% for early onset, we see um, that it is coded for in genetics, is that as we get older, maybe those dopamine neurons are destroyed. Um, and uh, so the body may go to work and start destroying its own dopamine neurons. So we see development and program death of dopamine producing neurons. We see those Lewy bodies that you just saw in the last slide, I'll go back to it, where it's sort of eating away at the neurons and destroying them, causing these bodies uh, by plaque, basically plaques attacking the, um, attacking the neurons. And we'll talk more about plaques and something we call tangles in the next chapter when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we know that there is a lower, um, sometimes a lower ability or diminished ability to metabolize some sort of environmental toxins like lead and things like that, um, that may cause that. A lot of people who uh, used to live in apartments where there was asbestos or, or like lead-based paint, um, that might have helped to um, break down some of those neurons. That's an environmental sort of um, attack. Um, or sometimes things like subtle brain injuries, toxins like carbon monoxide, again, herbicides and pesticides that off of the fruit and vegetables. Um, so that might have been a cause for a lot of people. Um, when we talk about brain injury, probably the most famous um, brain injury type uh, or, or person with brain injuries that turned into Parkinson's was Muhammad Ali, the great boxing champion. Um, he sustained a lot of hits to the head uh, during his boxing career. And towards the end, before he passed, um, he battled Parkinson's for years, which again, neuroscientists were fairly sure that was um, the cause of repeated blows to the head. Um, we see something uh, specific or something similar in some NFL, former NFL players who have had traumatic um, injuries to the head. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily show up as Parkinson's, um, but it can show up in many different forms, including symptoms of Parkinson's um, in some, uh, in an earlier onset um, that has to do with um, repeated hits to the head, like I said. But Muhammad Ali would probably be the most famous case of a boxer. Um, one of the things that we've seen that treats it indirectly and not even um, meant as a function for this is caffeine. Because what it does is it, remember we talked about caffeine that it blocks adenosine receptors, but it also indirectly by blocking adenosine receptors causes increases in both dopamine and acetylcholine. Um, and so this seems to reduce the risk. Remember acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's involved in learning and memory in the brain, but also is the one that activates the muscles in the peripheral nervous system. So it seems to increase, uh, I'm sorry, reduce the risk, not increase, I was going to say prevent against, but it reduces the risk by maybe as much as 80%. Um, not saying that caffeine is necessarily the best thing for you, but hey, um, it's a nice alternative if uh, it can help to prevent against Parkinson's. Um, if you have genetic basis, um, then it's probably not going to help as much. But so reducing risk by 80% is in people who don't have the genetic um, coding for getting it as well. Um, and also nicotine may help to prevent an accumulation of neurotoxins. So smoking may prevent or maybe stave it off a little bit. But again, as we've talked about the dangers of smoking, the um, negatives definitely outweigh any positives. It may slightly help you in learning and memory. Um, it may slightly prevent the accumulation of these neurotoxins that can uh, form the Lewy bodies, but overall smoking is gonna be worse for you than trying to save your movement, right? So just throwing that out there. Um, again, the main treatment that seems to work the best, and this is why we had um, talked about it so fondly in chapter three is stem cell treatment. Because if uh, these 
transplanted embryonic cells in the brain of a Parkinson's patient can then become new dopamine neurons and they are not destroyed. As long as there is not something like Lewy bodies actively trying to destroy them more, maybe, you know, they're destroyed and then that's kind of, then they're kind of left alone. If we can insert more new uh, neurons in there, then we can actually patch the hole in the boat, right? We can actually give more dopamine. Um, and as long as those neurons don't get destroyed later down the line, this could be a potential cure for Parkinson's. So of course they're working on this um, all the time in the scientific fields, but you know, there's always hope. So uh, the other main disorder of movement that's related to the basal ganglia is kind of the opposite of Parkinson's disease, where Parkinson's disease shows sort of a involuntary lack of movement, trouble initiating, tremors at rest, all of that stuff. Then Huntington's disease is kind of the opposite of that. Huntington's disease is also a degenerative disorder of the motor system, also involves cell loss of the striatum, but a lot of times you get um, sort of involuntary movements instead of lack of movement. So motor symptoms, writhing, so it looks like you're rolling around in pain or grimacing, making weird um, facial expressions and uh, exaggerated movements are actually due to degeneration of neurons in the striatum. Um, it just attacks a little bit differently than um, than Parkinson's disease. And this one is one of the rare ones that points to one specific gene that sort of gets things out of whack. Um, other symptoms, which you also see with Parkinson's disease is cognitive impairment. So your um, not just motor system is declining, but over time your learning and memory, right? Um, we see depression, personality changes. Um, and this is probably due to a domino effect of first cell loss in the basal ganglia and then progressively worse through the brain, just like we see with Parkinson's disease. So the progression is fairly similar. The symptoms are just a little bit different. So Huntington's disease is caused by a dominant mutation in the Huntington gene. The reason it's called the Huntington gene, the person who discovered it, Dr. Huntington, um, got to put his name on it. And um, what Huntington found is that in this specific gene in the fourth chromosome, there are a bunch of repeats on the gene. So remember that these genes are made up of these nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, ACGT. And um, that uh, the pattern of these nucleotides makes up the gene. Um, a regular gene uh, for the Huntington gene has somewhere between 10 to 30-ish or 33, 34 uh, repetitions of CAG, so cytosine, adenine, guanine. So if you're looking at the sequences of the proteins, right, in the Huntington gene, you see CAG, 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 et cetera, in a row. If you have 10 to about 33 or 34, that's the normal range, this person will not develop um, Huntington's disease. However, if you have 35 or more, and now a little more specifically, it's probably best to say 37, any more than 37 repetitions, that person will develop eventually Huntington. Um, so it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And some people have uh, an earlier onset, as we saw with Parkinson's, that less than 10% have an early onset. The more repetitions you have, the earlier the onset. So um, if you guys are familiar with the show House, um, in the last three seasons of the show, there was a character played by uh, Olivia Wilde, and um, House named her 13. And 13 had a family history of Huntington's disease. And there was a whole sub storyline about her not knowing if she was going to have it and how House wanted to get her genetically tested, whether or not um, she was gonna know. He wanted to know, of course. Um, and so um, I can say spoiler alert because the show was on like 10 years ago or more. So she did end up having the genetics for 
Huntington's disease. Um, so again, uh, anywhere 35 to 30, 35 to 40, you will get it probably later on after your 60s. The more repeats though, some people have higher repeats. There may be, you know, 40, 50 repeats of CAG. So those that um, have a higher number of repeats uh, tend to get it sooner. Uh, there's no number that's associated with a certain age. It's not like if you have 50 repeats, you're gonna get it by the age of 35. But what it means is more repeats, you're gonna get it earlier than somebody with less repeats. Um, so the neuron loss is probably due to an accumulation of the protein. If you have so much repeats, you're accumulating more and it's sort of destroying it from within. So in this case, it seems to be excessive dopamine that might be destroying the brain. Um, and so the only real drug that's approved for Huntington's disease is one that um, reduces excess dopamine. So it's um, very much like what we'll talk about as an antipsychotic for um, schizophrenia. But this is not schizophrenia. This is a movement disorder, right? Um, glutamate, remember the main excitatory neurotransmitter. There is an anti-glutamate drug that looks like it may be able to prevent cell death from overstimulation, but they're still working on uh, a way to do that. They're still trying to perfect that. This was as of, you know, five years ago or so that they were maybe four years ago that they were in the process of doing that. So there's not really too much medication for Huntington's disease um, as far as treatment goes. And um, could stem cell research be used for this one? Uh, it's definitely more promising for Parkinson's than for Huntington's. Um, so here again, we do not have a slide, so allow me to move down and show you guys. Um, the, uh, basically, what I'm showing you guys is um, looking at the brain on the left, you can see the intact brain of, an old, of a person that has passed away, and on the right, the brain of, uh, that has been dissected and um, after death of somebody that suffered from Huntington's disease. So you can see a lot less cells. You can see arrows pointing to where it was healthy on the left and definitely missing and not healthy on the right. Um, and again, it's designed um, to reduce, any treatment is uh, designed to reduce any sort of excess um, supplies of dopamine. So here is brain deterioration from um, Huntington's disease. Finally, we go to the last slide of the chapter. And I think maybe there's two. Oh, sorry, last two slides of the chapter. And we talk about the last one, um, which again, you can't see the slide, but um, we sort of talked about this um, earlier in the class when we talked about uh, chapter two and neuronal movement uh, neuronal communication. The uh, thing that helps the action potentials to go down the axon is the myelin on the axon, which acts as a conductor and speeds up everything, makes sure that the um, message is nice and strong, that the action potential doesn't propagate backwards or go out the sides. So it serves as a perfect sort of um, conductor, right? And multiple sclerosis is the other movement disorder that we discussed, which is caused by deterioration of the myelin. So basically the nervous system attacks itself and it stops. Not only does it stop myelinating, but it takes the myelin off of the axons. Um, so this demyelination that we talked about causes slowing or elimination of neural impulses. And it of course reduces the, the speed and strength of these movements or action potentials. When the neurons are demyelinated, they are less efficient. If the efficiency is gone, the neurons pretty much die. And the problem is, is when they die, they leave a hardened scar tissue so that um, it's not like we can just replace them uh, or things like that. So again, let's go back to um, the next slide over here. And you can see the picture of demyelination of the axons. What should be white matter in that pathway where those red arrows are is dark. Um, so the demyelinated neurons die. So it's not only showing you that it's not white, but it's also showing you that they're leaving behind hardened scar tissue. So information can't flow through those areas, right? Um, so 
That's the idea with multiple sclerosis. That is a third movement disorder. Uh, this one is not specific to the basal ganglia. So to sum it up, demyelination and neuron loss then results in um, not just scar tissue, but what that causes is information not to be able to go to the muscles. So it causes muscular weakness because they're not being used, right? The muscles are gonna atrophy. It can cause tremors, impaired coordination, um, because there's also muscles that control your bladder and bowels. It can lead to urinary and bowel incontinence. And of course, the visual system as well can suffer. Um, this idea of the cells demyelinating seems to be an autoimmune reaction, which can be triggered by um, genetics or some sort of earlier viral disease, such as a disease called Epstein-Barr. If you ever had mumps or measles, which is why we have vaccines, and I'm not gonna get into that, but you get it. Um, so what do these things do? How do we help? Why do drugs work in this case, including vaccinations? because they can modify immune activity and slow the progress of the disease. The problem is um, any drugs that you take or things like that, um, much like Parkinson's disease, they can't repair the harm. They can only try to slow things down. With L-DOPA, dopamine is coming and trying to increase to you know, make, decrease the uh, symptoms, but the problem is, um, is that it's not fixing the problem unless you have stem cells. Will stem cells work here? Not really because you, you have the neurons. It's just that the axons are unmyelinated. Um, maybe if you form new ones, it might be um, possible, but with that scar tissue, it's hard to, to do so. So um, again, if you're wondering why stem cell research isn't just easy, hey, let's take the old ones out, replace them with the new ones and we're done. Well, there's a lot of obstacles. There's a lot of specifics involved. So it's not as easy as just simply replacing them. Thanks for listening. Thanks for paying attention. Um, the exam on chapters 9, 10, and 11 will be next week. So um, as always, I will update you and talk to you soon.